Let me get my timing together. We're back. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> um, Brian, I'm just going to let you take this one away because uh, I know we're both excited about this panel. So We're back. And we're back. Um, <laughs> um, Brian, I'm just going to let you. There we go. Mute. Because um, there's a slight delay. Uh, so yeah, we're excited about this panel. Um, we've been participating in the ESEP community for uh, several years now, and it's it's our honor to be able to share some of those distinguished individuals and the opportunity for them to share their perspectives with you all. Um, we get to uh, uh, talk to them at least once a month. Um, so uh, we'd love to to let you peek into uh, our our experiences. We have uh, uh, Sarah Dunton. Uh, Dr. Jean, I'm not pronounce that, Ryu, Dr. Jamie Payton, Payton and Dr. Richard Latner um, to come and talk to you all a little bit about resources for broadening participation in computing. Yes, Ru, like, like rooster. Thank you. <laughs> um, so without any further ado, let's bring the panel to the stage and um, give you guys a taste of what we get to experience every month, some, some fascinating conversation and, and uh, presentations. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all here. My team, I want to make it clear that, yes, I am with the ESEP Alliance, but we have created this uh, BPC Roadshow. Uh, so we are from multiple alliances um, working to broaden participation in computing. Uh, these are just the other leaders who said yes to a crazy idea. So uh, <laughs> glad to be on this panel with, with all of you. All right, let me get the slides up. Be sure and turn on the captions too, Sarah. Yes, thank you, Richard. Give me one second here. All right. Get us back where we want to be and captions. Excellent. All right. Not sure. Yep, there we go. All right, so uh, it is great to be here with all of you, and thank you, Brian, Lynn, and the team who have put this together. Um, I want to start us off with some thinking about how to engage with this panel as um, the audience. Um, if you can use on the stage the Q&A, we will be monitoring that, and Lynn and Brian will, will help. Um, we really want to make sure that we're getting resources in front of you that will help you in your classrooms and in your advocacy for computer science education and equity work. Um, so we hope to be either the resources that you're looking for or that our projects are those resources or that we can flood you with those uh, in, in the chat. So um, please, please use that feature. And then uh, I will say, I don't think that I am necessarily the expert in this space. Uh, I imagine that many of you in the audience that we can't see uh, are the experts in this uh, broadening participation space. So we would love to amplify the work that you're doing. Um, so don't just put in questions, but put in ideas, uh, put in projects that you're working on, and uh, we would love to learn from you uh, during this time. All right, with that being said, we're gonna give you a big picture of what this thing, this broadening participation computing thing is, and then we're gonna go into our individual projects. Richard. Uh, yeah, I'm Richard Ladner uh, from the University of Washington and the principal investigator for Access Computing and Access CS for All. I think many of you have seen this picture before. This is uh, 2016 when Obama announced the Computer Science for All initiative. And, and that was uh, kind of a great moment. We all got excited by that and, and so on. But actually things happened before that. Uh, could you advance that? Sarah? In theory, there we go. So what happened before that was way back in 2005, the National Science Foundation uh, started the Size Broadening Participation and Computing Program. And, and so the, the goal of that at that time was to, to deal with the problem of equity uh, 
inclusion and diversity in in the computing field. And there wasn't much thought perhaps about uh, K through 12, but a few of us were interested in K through 12. Um, and so could you go to the next slide? Um, anyway, going back to the BPC organizations, not all of these started in 2005, but many of these did. I'm not gonna go through the whole list here, uh, but several of these uh, were started, well, they didn't initially start with a K through 12 focus, but they eventually picked it up. So could you go to the next one, Sarah? So these five alliances, Access Computing, Real CS, ESEP, uh, uh, NCWIT, the National Center for Women in Information Technology, and the STARS Computing course they all started in around 2005, 2006, 2007. And not all of them started with a K through 12 focus. Access Computing didn't. I don't think the National Center for Women and Information Technology did either. I don't think STARS did. Uh, Real CS did, of course, because they were formerly in the loop. And ESEP was actually didn't even exist at that time. It was a couple of other alliances. Uh, and there were, I would say, especially one of the one from Georgia, which I forgot the name already. Sarah, what was the name of that? Of course, I'm going to blank on it, Richard, but by the time I present, I'll remember. Georgia Computes. Georgia Computes. It was. <laughs> yeah, it took me, a, hey, I feel good. I didn't forget it totally. Um, that was a K through 12 uh, interest in that. But gradually over time, uh, these five alliances got involved in, in K through 12 computer science education and the diversity issues around that. Next slide. So I just want to, there's nobody representing NC Wit here. So I thought I'd mention the three things that they're doing uh, very quickly. One is Aspirations in Computing, which is an early program of NC Wit uh, to award high school students, women high school students who are doing some innovation in their high schools in the computing space. And uh, that goes way back. I remember nominating some students uh, at that time. Okay, there's a guy. We're, we have painters in our house right now. There's a guy right outside my window, and I'm going to close it. Just a second. In case you didn't have that on your, what are you going to experience in your video call? Bingo. Uh, that's the next yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just put its ladder up beside me. Um, they also have a, a relatively new K through 12 alliance, and and you know, uh, that's uh, uh, you know teachers, counselors, and so on. Uh, in the K through 12 space. And then they also have a counselors for computing uh, program as well. Next slide. So I'm gonna start talking about Access Computing. It was founded in 2006. It was one of the first alliances. Um, I'm the principal investigator of Cheryl Bergstaller, Jake Wobrock and Amy Coe are their co-PIs. And we're all out of the University of Washington, uh, the Paul G. Allen School for Computer Science and Engineering, the Information School and the DOIT Center at the University of Washington. Um, next slide. So we have a, a goal, um, increase the participation and success of students with disabilities in computing fields. And there's a picture here, three pictures here. The picture on the left are some students I actually worked with both blind at the University of Washington. They're uh, they're college students. The one in the center is a deaf student I worked with who's a high school student. Um, and she's doing, I think, Scratch that at that time. And on the right is another high school student who's working on another project that I created as well. So next slide. So we have uh, two basic strategies in access computing. One is direct interventions. Uh, we've worked with over a thousand students with disabilities over the last 15 years. Uh, we currently have 550 in our cohort. Um, and there's peer mentoring and we do career development activities. Uh, it just so happens a picture on the right there, which is a me with a bunch of blind kids back at the National Federation of the Blind. This was probably 10 years ago. And we were doing some uh, computer science unplugged activities, which uh, that, was, that was quite a kick. We also work on institutional change. We have 70 partners. Uh, they're mostly uh, universities, about uh, 50 of those. And we also have uh, companies and organizations like the organizations on 
that are represented here are all uh, partners of ours. And the idea of having a partner is that we help them uh, uh, change, do institutional change at their own institutions. And we fund things like mini grants and so on. And we also do some trainings. Uh, so that's kind of access computing. Next slide. So under access computing, we started a new project called Access CS for All. And this is a joint project between the uh, University of Washington and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. It's a, a, in, in NSF terms, it's called a collaborative uh, project. And both Andrea Stefik and I are the PIs and Cheryl Bergstaller is the, is the co-PI. And this started in 2014. And so this was our flip uh, to working with K through 12. Next slide. So the goal there is increase the participation of students with disabilities in K through 12 computer science. And here are three pictures of students. The, the, one, the two on the right are a couple of deaf students I worked with, uh, high school students at the University of Washington. And the two on the left are students that, work at, that have worked in, in the Dewitt Center in their program. So next slide. So Access CS for All has two strategies as well. One is development of curricula and tools. And a major development is the Quorum uh, programming language and Quorum Studio, which is its IDE for that language, which is a very interesting and accessible language. We also worked on um, uh, developing a computer science principles curriculum that's totally accessible, especially to screen reader users, because none of the current um, computer science principles endorsed curricula are very accessible at all to blind users. And we also do professional development. In fact, after this meeting today, I'm going to a professional development uh, workshop online one uh, for teachers of neurodiverse students. And we've already held two other workshops um, in the last uh, three years, one for teachers of blind and visually impaired. And that's the first picture on the right there, and one for deaf and hard of hearing, which is the second picture on the right. And in these professional development workshops, we're helping them learn about uh, computer science principles and sort of getting them into the computer science for all movement, because not many of these teachers were or were aware of it. Uh, next slide. So I'm done. Jean. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Richard. That was super informative. And my name is Jean Rue. I'm the director of research of the UCLA Computer Science Equity Project. And I'm here representing a much larger collaboration that we call Real CS that's focused on four major efforts. One is creating and supporting the Exploring Computer Science curriculum, as well as its leading um, teacher professional development program. We also are focused on offering administrators and leadership with an equity guide and professional development for implementation of computer science in public schools. And we are also conducting research, which includes an effort to elevate underrepresented high school students' perspectives and voices in beginner computer science classrooms. So next slide, please. More specifically, following our team's research that resulted in the book Stuck in the Shallow End uh, back in the mid-ish 2000s, um, Joanna Good from University of Oregon and Gail Chapman created the Exploring Computer Science curriculum in 2008. And this course helped fill a gap in um, public high schools where students usually have access to only typing classes focused on rudimentary word processing skills. Or if they're lucky, they might have an AP computer science class, but nothing in between. And so this was like the first class that was introduced to high schools that was like, hey, this can really be engaging, hands on, really meant for students who've had no previous experience to computer science and none of that preparatory privilege to access it outside of school um, in conjunction with a long term professional development. Next slide, please. Um, so this professional development in exploring computer science supports educators across three guiding principles of the curriculum, equity, inquiry-based learning, and CS concepts. And these PDs are led um, with Joanna and Gail, but also by experienced ECS teachers. So the PDs begin with a summer institute that gives educators an immersion into inquiry-based teaching, as well as culturally responsive pedagogy through a teacher-learner-observer model where educators can actually practice engaging with both the content and teaching skills of the curriculum. 
And then throughout the school year, teachers join quarterly workshops. Some receive in-classroom instructional coaching and teachers remain connected with one another through a larger professional community online. Um, and many return for then a second summer institute to reconnect and continue building off of their learning after having, teaching, having taught ECS for a year. Next slide, please. ECS itself is meant to be culturally responsive, hands-on and engaging for any student, regardless of their preconceived notions of who can or should excel with computing or any um, insecurities they might have for not having had computer science previously. And there are six curricular units that support engagement with six key computational practices as listed on this slide. And um, next slide, please. Uh, as the curriculum is continuously being updated and with uh, supplemental units, such as this e-textiles unit, uh, where youth gain opportunities to create physical projects involving sewing and microcomputers, where they can build in lights and music, sensors, um, into fabric banners and t-shirts, et cetera. Um, this curriculum and the professional development are constantly evolving and improving to really focus on these social aspects of like, what is computer science in our world and how can everyone have access to it? Um, sort of the theme of this conference, right? CS for social good. Next slide, please. Our team has also developed resources to support administrators and leadership in keeping equity at the center of CS implementation. Bringing computer science into K-12 schools can feel like a really daunting task, and especially when the goal is also to ensure that all students have access to really quality learning experiences. And so that's why our team, led by Julie Flappin and Roxana Haddad, have collaborated with experienced administrators to create an equity guide written by and for administrators. And it covers all the major questions administrators may have as they begin bringing computing into their schools. Next slide, please. But of course, a guide is not enough. So this resource goes hand in hand with an administrator workshop, which is led by our team in collaboration with our um, administrators in a research practice partnership. We're collaborating with 14 local education agencies. And the workshop seeks to really build community, to review CS course taking data, reflect on supports and challenges to CS implementation, and help leadership leave with a beginning plan of a course of action to, that focuses on equity and CS implementation in their schools. Uh, our goal is to now spread this beyond the state of California, which we began this, in which we began this work, um, and to start building collaborations with states across the nation to grow the work together. Next slide, please. In the coming months, we'll be hosting a Train the Trainer event where administrators can learn how to lead these activities with other administrators and begin this work of really spreading computer science in schools. Next slide, please. And soon there will be a how-to guide out in October, so stay tuned. Uh, this is in collaboration with ESA. Um, and then next slide, please. <laughs> and finally, we have also been engaging in educational research, both in teacher professional development, which Joanna Good has been working on, and in high school classrooms, which I have been leading. So in collaboration with Jane Margolis and educators in Los Angeles and Mississippi, our goal is to really amplify the voices and perspectives of students coming from communities historically underrepresented in the field, specifically low-income urban Latinx youth and low-income rural Black youth because we really wanna understand what works best for their sense of engagement, agency, and identity with computing. Youth experience firsthand what works and doesn't work in their classrooms, and we know there's a lot that we can be learning from them to improve our work as teachers, administrators, and policymakers and curriculum developers. Next slide, please. This slide just shows the many partners who are involved in this work. We work as research practice partnership with educators, um, and so this shows pictures of folks who have either been involved in the past or are currently involved in Los Angeles and Mississippi. Um, and the next slide, please. And so um, we've been recording and sharing various videos um, highlighting students' voices, which are available on our project website, which is on this um, screen. I'm not gonna have time to read this quote, so you can take a screenshot if you like and read it on your own. But um, we're excited because we're continuing to follow students' experiences longitudinally as well. And so we hope to offer more resources over time to share student stories that hopefully can inspire you and um, really help you in your work in the classroom. And in particular, one of the key things we're learning through this effort is that students really want their computer science education experiences to connect to the real social, political, and ethical issues they care about in their communities. So really the CS for social good, that's what gets students engaged in computing education. So um, next slide, please. If you want any more information, please take a screenshot, reach out to any of us about any of these resources and we'd be happy to help you out.
Thanks so much. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Payton. I'm director of the STARS Computing Corps, one of the NSF Broadening Participation and Computing Alliances. Next slide, please. Um, within STARS, we're an alliance of more than 50 colleges and universities who've made a commitment to taking action to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in computing. And STARS helps to support that through three main strategies. By building capacity um, for faculty and students to um, take action for broadening participation of historically excluded groups in computing, by igniting and supporting action for broadening participa participation in computing, and by fostering community and commitment around broadening participation in computing, particularly by focusing on elements of uh, social justice and using computing for social good. Can you go on to the next slide, please? STARS has a, a lot of programs and events. Uh, I've listed a few here. Uh, we have programs and events um, that are primarily targeted at college students and faculty, but that have direct benefits and, and uh, address issues in K-12. Um, the main program that I'm gonna highlight here, there are two of them, the STARS Leadership Corps. Um, the STARS Leadership Corps is a cohort-based service learning and leadership program that college students in computing engage in, and they take on projects that are designed to broaden participation in computing. Uh, they often focus on serving the needs of uh, teachers, administrators, and students in K-12. We also have an annual conference um, identified in the lower left right-hand corner, the STAR Celebration, where we provide training annually for those college students that are going to engage with K-12 educators and K-12 students um, to, to share with them some uh, inclusive pedagogy strategies and to uh, talk about the types of curriculum that they might deliver, for example, working with ECS type of curriculum um, and also with uh, access computing type strategies, and also sort of sharing information, for example, uh, by inviting ESEP representatives to give talks at that conference. We have one other conference that is for um, educators and researchers called the RESPECT Conference. Uh, this is a conference that convenes people who are interested in research on broadening participation in computing. Uh, we are really fortunate this year to have uh, Jean Rue as our general chair this uh, year and had some really excellent talks. Um, you can go to the RESPECT website if you'd like to look at some of the emerging research on um, equity um, and, and justice-centered computing education. It's a really fantastic conference. Next slide, please. I'd like to focus just for a minute, mo for a minute longer on the STARS Leadership Corps, which is a program of the STARS uh, Computing Corps Alliance. Again, we engage uh, college students uh, in team projects that are focused around using computing uh, for social good. And primarily, we focus on advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in computing. And we do that, again, by partnering with K-12 educators. Uh, so across the country, there are several STARS Computing Core chapters at local universities. They work with uh, local school systems. Um, and identify needs, working hand in hand with uh, teachers and administrators there to sort of figure out what is the, the need in this community? Is it at the middle school level? Is it at the high school level? Uh, what kinds of uh, supports could college students with some computing knowledge provide uh, for CS education? Could you go on to the next slide, please? I'm gonna give an example of one uh, key kind of project uh, that the STARS Alliance led at the national level, in addition to the STARS Computing Corps, we call this our STARS CS for All Scholars Program. Uh, last year, at the start of the pandemic, we recognized that um, high school educators have been trained in CS principles or ECS or other uh, types of curriculum to deliver high uh, quality uh, equity-focused computer science education in their schools. And so they 
a lot of you as educators have a great grasp of the content. You have ongoing professional development um, through those communities. Um, one of the things that you'll find, and you've probably already found, is that in your classrooms, a, an important way that we teach computer science is to facilitate collaboration among your students. Uh, and also we focus on individualizing learning and trying to uh, make sure that we have pathways for learning for all individuals in computer science. So high school educators are often trained uh, to do all of these things and it can be challenging to, to develop the skills for that. Um, but, but you as educators are really excelling and, and pushing forward on that. Next slide, please. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we, we recognized that it was very difficult for teachers who may have been just recently trained in uh, delivering a particular sort of uh, curriculum uh, and also understanding how to do collaboration in their physical classrooms and individualization. And now there's sort of this new spectrum of um, access that students may have. Some students may have not had any kind of internet access or devices. Some may have only been able to connect by mobile phones. Some had full uh, internet access with um, high quality laptops. So there's this wide range uh, of ways that students might be able to interact with the content. And um, how do we take what we already know and deliver it to students in a way that could be more equitable to give more access to students across that full spectrum. We also recognize that this is something that was not be uh, useful just for the pandemic, but recognizing that there is a context for learning um, and that context will differ at each school. So how can we tailor for the students at our schools? And that's what the STARS Yes for All Scholars program was designed for. Next slide, please. So in our STARS Yes for All Scholars program, we form teams that co-create remote learning materials or any types of materials that tailor existing curricular content to the context of the students at your school. So essentially we think of this as a research experience program that combines research experiences for teachers and computer science education with research experiences for undergraduates in computer science education as well. So teams of students and teachers work together. Uh, our teams were formed of two computer science undergraduate students, a graduate student mentor, and a student from the College of Education or from the Department of Education. Uh, and that group of students would work with two high school teachers uh, for an extended period of time, six weeks for the students, the students began with a one week sort of crash course in CS education and pedagogy and these kinds of things. Um, a four week experience working closely together with those undergraduate student teams with the K-12 educators. And then a follow up one week uh, with the undergraduate students to take what they learned from the teachers and to try to put it in practice and to report out on it. Next slide, please. So this is a sample uh, activity that was a guided activity for our STARS CS for All Scholars teams. Uh, this is a set of reflection questions that would guide us to consider what support is needed in a virtual learning experience that would have been different from the ways that uh, it had been done before. And this particular reflection activity uh, asked computer science students, education students uh, to reflect on some questions separately and then come together to discuss, um, sort of taking their unique experiences and perspectives and putting them together. This particular reflection, for example, was about how do you uh, take a well-known practice called pair programming um, that we know how to do in person roughly, uh, but we may not know how to do it when students have differing degrees of, of access. Um, so this was an activity that the, the Star CS for All Scholar students went through, uh, met with teachers, and came up with solutions that they could implement in their classroom. Next slide, please. Um, so through this program in one summer, we had 16 teachers and, and uh, student teams, sorry, eight student and teacher teams participating. Uh, and they created over 40 new CS learning materials in the course of just six weeks. 
Um, and those materials are things that teachers are putting into practice in their classrooms over this past year. Uh, one of the great outcomes that we think uh, is important for K-12 educators is that as a result of their participation, teachers reported that they had increased confidence in teaching CS uh, because they felt like they had a new resource uh, that they could go to uh, to sort of help them figure out and bounce ideas off of and actually be an extra pair of hands to help them implement and create new learning materials for their classrooms. Next slide, please. So um, I'd just like to recognize the team that helped to put together this CS for All Scholars program, uh, especially Tiffany Barnes, who is the co-PI for STARS Computing Corps, uh, and her team at NC State uh, helped to facilitate a lot of the uh, research experiences that went on last summer. This is a program that we hope to continue, and there are lots of other resources that STARS can offer to K-12 educators. Uh, if you're interested, please feel free to follow up with me. Uh, I'll drop my email in the chat, and the contact information is also on the slide. As Jean said, you might want to take a screenshot and just uh, reach out to us um, after this presentation. We'd love to hear from you. And that's it for me. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk about ESEP. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, you, you all are a hard group to follow. Um, I always appreciate hearing about your, your projects. Uh, so the Expanding Computing Education Pathways Alliance, uh, I am the director of the alliance, but I work with a team uh, in other ESEP states, Dr. Fletcher in Texas, uh, Ann Leftwich and Maureen Biggers in Indiana, Deborah Richardson in California, Josh Childs also in Texas. Um, so we feel like it's really important to have our leadership in states that are working with our model uh, to broaden participation in computing through advocacy and policy work. Um, so we're, we are all on the ground doing the work while we're trying to figure out how to scale this work in other states. Uh, and as Richard mentioned, this work really did originate in Georgia through Georgia Computes. Uh, ESEP exists because of Georgia Computes and a project in Massachusetts called uh, Kate. And the National Science Foundation saw these two projects making change at the state level and said, hey, let's let's see if you can scale this. So you can see that we're now in 22 states and the territory of Puerto Rico, um, learning from each other daily, weekly. Uh, Brian mentioned that we're on monthly calls together. Uh, so it's a constant exchange of knowledge in this equity space. I feel like I should say next slide, please. You are all very um, polite asking for next slides. So this is how we do our work. Um, we've created this five stage model of state change. Um, we, we are always considering adding other uh, pieces of this work. Um, it's about finding leaders and change agents. And uh, I think I see 80 people on this call. You, you are all leaders and change agents doing this work. Um, it, it's, it doesn't take much to make change in your community, your classroom. Uh, and every little bit helps to move this computer science education work across the US. Um, you'll notice that broadening participation in computing is central to our work. Uh, we probably spend the most time saying, how is this moving equity, right? It's, it's easy to sort of cast this wide net and just talk about computer science. It's much harder when you're talking about doing it uh, with a focus on equity. Uh, so if we're not naming the populations that we're working with or naming the systems that aren't working, we're never going to be able to make change um, at the state level and the national level. So finding leaders and change agents, understanding the landscape, uh, so understanding the data, understanding who's doing the work, uh, not recreating the wheel, but reaching out, uh, building partnerships, um, summits, uh, so much like this PD, uh, offering summits, getting your message out, whether it's at the district level uh, or at the state level, uh, Georgia has quite a track, rec track record of, of exceptional summits. So the, the next uh, piece is getting funding, but that's really about sustainability. It's about resources, uh, really more about human resources than, than funding, than uh, grant funding. Um, and then our newest stage, the fifth stage, being building and utilizing a data infrastructure. And uh, Brian, maybe you can drop in your Georgia dashboard. Um, California also has an amazing dashboard, but this idea that data needs to be transparent, we need to understand it so that we understand the communities that we need to be doing this work for. 
um, and understanding if, if we even are looking at the right data, um, but not just doing this because it's a, a feel good project, doing this because we know that there are inequities in this space. So how do we center broadening participation in computing? Um, you've heard from the other alliances. Uh, they're very focused on, on specific populations of students. ESEP doesn't select one population. We work with states to identify the populations of students that are, are marginalized historically in computing. Um, you can't just say one size fits all and we're gonna choose this curriculum because it might not work for all the students. Uh, one district is going to look very different than the district next door. So it's really about place-based um, actions. And then when you build that up to a state, I mean, every state looks very different. Uh, and that's a good thing because that allows us to learn from each other. So by the numbers, what does this look like? Well, we have 23 highly engaged state teams uh, that are bringing resources to the table that are trying things out, um, sometimes failing, but failures are beautiful. We heard from two students in computer science yesterday who uh, talked about the mistakes and how that helped them to grow and making mistakes with their teachers. ESEP is no different. Um, we don't have a, a, a plan necessarily that says this is how you do it. Um, we try things, uh, we hit some roadblocks and we try different things. We look at policies and we say, is this really helping with equity? And if it's not, you know, let's not move forward on that policy, let's not advocate for it, or let's see if we can talk about getting it rewritten. Um, so state teams make this all work. Uh, I mentioned the landscape reports. So publishing uh, pieces about data, executive summaries, make it make sense to people who have no time to make sense of things. We can present and we can show lots of numbers, but it needs to be friendly. Uh, and welcoming and people need to flip through it and understand it quickly. Uh, you often don't have a lot of time to make the case for broadening participation in computing. And then how do you sustain it? We want uh, teams building strategic plans. Uh, we want to hold those state summits. Um, and it's sort of simple. It's hanging a shingle, networking, borrowing and adapting, don't recreate the wheel, and then lead. Even if you think your idea is not working, run with it, see how it works, and then be entrepreneurial, take it back to the drawing board and rework it if needed. So I wanna be clear, this work is relational. Um, knock on the door next to you. Um, uh, it takes a whole village. I couldn't do this work without the other alliances. Our team couldn't do this work without the alliances. Um, it takes broad-based leadership teams, both in the fields that they're coming from but also making sure that your teams are as diverse as the students that you want to serve. Um, it doesn't work to just have industry at the table because you think that they're gonna bring the resources. If you're going to make sustainable change, making sure that you've got a diversity of folks at the table because everybody sees this work through a different lens and that's incredibly important. So ESEP does all this work through virtual calls. Um, before the pandemic, we were on Zoom um, having monthly calls. Um, we're obviously a dispersed network. So we, uh, when we're not getting on planes, we're spending a lot of time on video calls and connecting people. We're, we're sort of the hub, ESEP is the backbone, we're a collective impact network, we're the hub that gets information out to folks. So this is a long list of stakeholders, but uh, we wanted to take the guesswork out of this. When people say, who should we be talking to? You really need to make sure that you are starting with K-12 educators because they're doing the work. You all know that you're doing the work in the classrooms, uh, but making sure you have researchers involved, industry, um, parents, community members that are going to influence your, your track record uh, of success. So how do we set the vision? These are questions we're constantly asking ourselves. How is this, whatever this is, how is this action supporting priority populations? That's your strategy focus. Uh, which students are the priority populations? Not guessing that you think that you know who the students are who've been marginalized, but looking at the data, having conversations, because it's not necessarily gonna appear in the data. We rely far too heavily on AP data. But you're not gonna understand what's happening in, in kindergarten through sixth grade, just looking at AP data. How can you make this sustainable? So if you've, you're, you're moving, always thinking about what does this look like in two years? What do you need to make sure that this is happening in five years? What are your successes? Um, 
And then is the need for systems change being involved? And that's the policy piece. Um, I think for, for too long, the data, it really tells a story about the students and why aren't they in the classrooms, but we really need to be holding adult, adults and policy as well as systems accountable. And I will say, ESEP has not always, not always been there, right? We are getting to that stage of, of that level of accountability. And then I've already spoken about leadership, but that is a key piece. Um, also, don't don't burn out with a small team. Um, make sure that you're you're working with nonprofits and and multiple folks. So I just lucked out looking for photos, and I was able to find um, uh, from our 2018 national summit some images of what the Georgia team came up with in their roadmap for uh, the next years of, of computing. Uh, so I was able to throw these up here. Um, but in 2018, and I think Georgia has gone well beyond this, the vision was to have authentic, accessible, culturally relevant, engaging computer science and computational thinking experience offered to every student in Georgia pre-K through 18. And I think the team has, has far exceeded that. And I look forward to seeing how all the educators and administrators in this PD continue to be a part of it. Uh, and, and that little post-it, uh, folks went around and put comments on, on all of it. Uh, somebody said, love the vision. So uh, great job to the Georgia team. Um, and, and really, this is sort of the BPC at the beginning and the end of this trajectory. This is how states work. Some states start with BPC at the beginning and then move from there. Some states start with strategies, and they don't really understand the 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 broadening participation or the equity piece of it. So they build to the BPC successes. And, and that message is, is really about start where you are, um, whether it's in the classroom making change, whether it's an administrator making the change at the district level or a superintendent, um, wherever you are starting is exactly where you should be starting and share your ideas. Um, so I'm gonna pull down the slides. We are gonna open up, um, I've got contact on here too. I'll put the slides back uh, in so everybody has access to all of our links. Um, but we're gonna start with discussions, uh, talk about resources and uh, share contact info. All right, I think uh, Lynn or Brian's coming back up. All right. And we're back. Well, thank you all. Those are, uh, I mean, there's a lot of information. <laughs> so we'll start with that. There's a lot to take in. Um, so I'll be looking forward to personally going back over this this uh, presentation's video and uh, kind of picking apart different pieces. Hopefully our teachers are as well. And so that's actually my first question. Um, some of you all mentioned the, uh, the openness to working with teachers in Georgia. We got some cutting edge uh, sharp as attack teachers here that are willing to do the work um, and are used to doing the work at all levels of experience, new teachers, uh, teachers that have been doing this for three or four years and teachers that are five or six years in. Um, are you guys working with, with teachers in Georgia? Are you willing to open up and, uh, and do some research with us? I think <laughs> that our group is always happy to learn and collaborate. So I think reach out and we can figure out ways to um, discuss ideas. I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times I think research projects and research practice partnerships, research practice partnerships, which is how I think a lot of us prefer to work, takes a lot of work and time to build and like, you know, understand like what is the shared interest? How can we support immediate um, usefulness of the research? Um, and then the unfortunate side of everything, though, is funding and <laughs> finding like who can fund um, what and create time. So, so while this invitation to say reach out may mean a collaboration doesn't happen for another two or three years, just be aware of that. <laughs> but I mean, I think that our team is all about, yeah, celebrating the work of what's going on outside of where our bubbles are. Glad to hear that, because um, I know that all of you all's work, uh, different people have spoken to me at different times and saying, well, how can we lean into that? And I'm like, well, we have some partners, especially with like uh, with Richard, some of the work that you're doing. I have a lot of folks that are interested in in how to include students with disabilities into some of this computer science experiences. Um, so there's that one. Um, another question is uh, 
Sarah mentioned place-based actions and initiatives. Um, and, and there's been a lot of conversation lately in Georgia about this, uh, this dichotomy of these place-based, community-based, the school or the school system that we're doing this initiative or this rollout in versus the broad approach, the, the systemic level. So how do you go from that place-based action to a broad systemic policy driven, something that's going to, to scale essentially? And that, that's a question for anybody because I know you guys are doing a lot of those scaling projects. Well, I'm, I'm happy to get started and, and I'd love somebody else's perspective on it too. I mean, obviously it needs to be a balance, but the danger is if you come in and say, we're going to broaden participation in computing, then you're going to create um, a project that might work really amazing in a urban setting, but will not work at all in a rural setting, right? I mean, that's just sort of an, an obvious one. Um, so, but if you have something that is working brilliantly in an urban setting, then get to know the other communities that look similar to your community and start to scale that way. Um, you might be able to borrow pieces from that project and adapt them to other communities, other populations, uh, but it, you, you have to know, right? I mean, educators know when you go into your school, you know that community. You can go four towns over and, you know, go to that grocery store, you're not going to be able to find the rice, right? Like you've got to, you've got to know the community in, in order to be able to serve the community. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, disability cuts across all demographics. And so they're everywhere. And so dealing, you know, scaling up in terms of disability is it's quite a challenge. Although, you know, the number of students with disabilities in K through 12 is, is something around 9 million in the United States, around 18%. So it's it's not a small number. Uh, some of the groups like blind students are really left out of computer science. Uh, that a lot of the curricula that's available, um, tools that are available, they're not, they're not accessible, screen reader accessible. So, you know, trying to get uh, other people to move forward. I mean, a good example is the Scratch language. The Scratch is very, very popular, but totally inaccessible. Um, and getting the scratch people to do something uh, uh, to, to change that is, is I'd say, uh, been a challenge over the last 15 years. They haven't done anything. So um, that's our story. At least scaling up is difficult. It's good to know. Um, and I'm definitely going to kind of borrow from what both of you said. Uh, definitely. So we do some uh, some statewide Zoom calls in Georgia, and based on what you said uh, and what you said, uh, Sarah and Richard, it sounds like we should do Zoom calls for each group, and then pull in experts from all of the that have done work in all of those uh, specific contexts, so that you can share with anybody else that hails from that context. So anybody that's interested in working with students with disabilities, we pull in Richard, maybe. Um, uh, my Israel from UF and different people that are working in that space to all be on the call together to share that. Likewise, for urban scenarios, we pull some some folks from Muskogee, which is an urban center, Savannah and Atlanta, and have them all talk to each other and, and other urban centers. So good, good ideas. Um, and let's just see if we have any other questions in the chat. I always have plenty of questions. I love While it. you're looking at the other questions, Brian, I was just thinking about this question of scale too and how um, it relates to this issue of like, we're not here just to teach computer science, right? We see that computer science is connected to these larger institutional um, forms of oppression that have been affecting our teachers, our students, our schools, and our communities. And I think that that's also part of the challenge of when we think about scale is like we're also thinking about how do we address our, our community, uh, support our communities to address these issues, right, um, through this uh, work in computer science education. And I... Um, and I think that it's really hard work, but it's also really exciting because I think especially during these difficult times, really in beautiful ways, people have been coming together to try to push against um, racial injustice and um, support Black Lives Matter and, you know, really trying to challenge white supremacy and think about that in the context of computer science education. And I think um, 
separately, Lynn had asked this question of how are we going to push broadening participation in these in these years to come, and I think that's something that we've been thinking about in our in our group, and I know all all the folks here have been thinking about like what does it mean to you know, these attacks on, for example, critical race theory or even talking about race in the classroom. What does it mean to be thinking about that in the context of computer science where, you know, usually computer science teachers are told, oh, you don't need to talk about that in your classrooms. But we're seeing very much so that actually we do need to be talking about those things. So I think um, I was just thinking about that in, in relation to this that question of scale, like there's also these broader issues that I think we're struggling with and thinking about. And, and I know that many of the teachers here today have really been doing that deep work in their classrooms too so you know and i would just say you know disability and technology cross paths a lot um people with disabilities rely on technology and so you know programming projects that deal with uh, accessibility are very popular and um you know right now for example hop in doesn't have captions they don't support it so the only way we can have captions is to have that on our, is, is to have that on our uh, PowerPoint or our, I guess it was a Google slides. Um, so, you know, you guys should be talking to Hopin. You want to use them next year. They should have captions. I've been talking to Hopin since we first engaged him about that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the very first conference, I was like, so what are you guys doing with disabilities? What are you guys? But again, yeah. that's because I've been ex exposed to your work and other folks that, that are like you. So that conversation proliferates mm -hmm. and hopefully eventually begins to impact these these technology company creators that um, that's, they see the need and they see the demand for it. So I, I completely yeah, so I think, you know, in, in K through 12 education, if you bring up the connection between disability and technology, mm -hmm. things that I mentioned earlier, like screen readers, captions, all these things are technologies and, you know, trying to make these technologies work uh, you know, generally, it's it's a challenge, and you know, kids might get really interested in this, and you know, thinking about social good, you know, building technology for people with disabilities is a social good. In fact, that's my my other hat, my research hat, is is working on accessible technologies. Definitely. <clears throat> Excellent refre reflection, um, and, and it definitely uh, fits the the mode of this this conference. Um, I said earlier that computer science is both um, a subject uh, and an object of social good in the fact that um, it's designed to solve problems. Um, so why not use it to solve some of the problems that the students are having, whether they're students with disabilities or students in uh, low socio socioeconomic neighborhoods or students of color, like solve some of their challenges. Um, that in of itself would help them engage more. We talked about yesterday, we heard that you build the relationship first. Well, that's how you build the relationship. And in that relationship building, you find out what are their challenges and then design your curriculum and your projects around that. Um, I think Lynn is telling us that we're at time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all tremendously for your for your sharing, for your, your resources, for your time, your energy. Um, I appreciate you uh, and look forward to further discussions. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Thank right, you, Brian. Teachers that are listening, Reach out to them. Thank you. Talk, touch base with them. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're about to go to lunch. This is an opportunity for you to network with people. If you click on that, the networking tab on your left uh, toolbar, it'll pair you with somebody else randomly and you can kind of spend some time first to go get some lunch, take a, a, a break and, and, and make sure all of your needs are met um, and then come back and, and spend some time with, with us networking. Look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>